If your toddler has been diagnosed with autism or is waiting for a diagnosis, you're going to want to pay attention for the next 60 seconds. Happy Ladders is parent-led early autism therapy that empowers you, the parent, to teach your toddler essential developmental skills through play. Studies have shown that the parent-led model is highly effective while eliminating frustration over long wait lists or the worry about losing precious developmental time, all without the disruption of people coming into your home. Happy Ladders includes activities that target 150 essential developmental skills every toddler needs, as well as assessments in four different developmental areas. There's also an exclusive community of parents just like you and professional coaching to ensure success for both you and your toddler. To learn more, get a free trial, and take advantage of an exclusive limited time offer for my listeners, visit happyladders.com. That's H-A-P-P-Y-L-A-D-D-E-R-S. Use the code THEAUTISMDAD at checkout to save 50% off the monthly membership. Plus, get a free one-on-one session as well as access to the Tantrums and Meltdown mini course. This is a limited time offer, so act now. If your toddler has been diagnosed with autism or is waiting for a diagnosis, you're going to want to pay attention for the next 60 seconds. Happy Ladders is parent-led early autism therapy that empowers you, the parent, to teach your toddler essential developmental skills through play. Studies have shown that the parent-led model is highly effective while eliminating frustration over long wait lists or the worry about losing precious developmental time, all without the disruption of people coming into your home. Happy Ladders includes activities that target 150 essential developmental skills every toddler needs, as well as assessments in four different developmental areas. There's also an exclusive community of parents just like you and professional coaching to ensure success for both you and your toddler. To learn more, get a free trial, and take advantage of an exclusive limited time offer for my listeners, visit happyladders.com. That's H-A-P-P-Y-L-A-D-D-E-R-S. Use the code THEAUTISMDAD at checkout to save 50% off the monthly membership. Plus, get a free one-on-one session as well as access to the Tantrums and Meltdown mini course. This is a limited time offer, so act now. Hey, what's up, folks? Uh, My name is Rob Gorski, and you're listening to the Autism Dad Podcast. I have tried to record this intro about two dozen times now, and I, I keep stopping and starting over again because I think it's important that everyone listens to... Um, my guest this week. And so what I'm going to do rather than, than try and word this perfectly is just tell you what my intentions are. Um, we're going to talk about vaccines and we're going to talk about all of the misinformation out there. Um, my guest is, is Dr. Ryan Marino. He's an ER physician and medical toxicologist at university hospitals in Cleveland. And I wanted to speak with him because He's a, he's a medical doctor at a respected hospital. He also has a background in toxicology. And one of the big things that people claim about vaccines are the toxic effects they have on the body. And they cause autism and mercury poisoning and all of this stuff that has, has been debunked over and over and over again. Guys, like we're in 2020 and we still are debating whether autism is caused by vaccines. This is insane. We have measles, uh, Coming back in epidemic proportions, we have whooping cough. My kids were treated uh, as a precaution for whooping cough last year because there was a kid in their class who was still vaccinated, but because other people weren't vaccinated, they caught it and were able to uh, to come to school and, and be contagious. Um, that's a problem. And, and we need to talk about this. We need to get facts and sound medical science out there. We need to tell people, if you have questions, talk to your doctor. Don't turn to Facebook or Twitter or other social media. Don't go to a website or a blog. Talk to your doctor. The decision about vaccinating is between you and your doctor. And we want it to have uh, as open and honest and transparent a conversation about this as possible. I took a bunch of listener questions and... Uh, we just have a conversation about vaccines and vaccine safety. We even touch on uh, vaccine injury and uh, the importance of vaccines, how they impact society, what would happen if we stopped vaccinating. Um, I know it's controversial. I know that I'm either going to gain listeners or lose them, uh, but there's a right and there's a wrong. And I feel like this is the right thing to do. Um, it's not worded perfectly right now, but it is what it is. And um you know, my mission is to, to help people better understand. And, and, you know, I feel that if I use my platform for positive things, the positive things can come from it. And so I want to present you guys with facts. I want to talk about something that people don't want to talk about. And 
Uh, I want to do it in a way that that helps you to to make better choices for your life and your family. So I really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. This is the first episode of season three. And um, yeah, so I figured we would just start off with a bang and and deal with something that needs to be dealt with. So uh, stay tuned. I really appreciate you guys uh, sticking with me. Uh, So we'll be right back after this commercial break. The Autism Dead is brought to you by Mightier. Mightier is an amazing program out of Harvard Medical and Boston Children's that utilizes video games in a wrist strap heart rate monitor to teach your kids to emotionally self-regulate. So if you are an autism parent like I am, that means fewer meltdowns. Fewer meltdowns means reduced parental stress and improved quality of life for your entire family. Uh, I've been using it with my son for over a year. It's absolutely fantastic. The games are fun. They're engaging. He loves it. Uh, He doesn't even realize that he's learning while he's doing it. And then he naturally applies it to the rest of his life. It's basically biofeedback for kids. So it does work for any child. Uh, But due to the nature of of autism, kids on the spectrum tend to have a more difficult time with emotional self-regulation. And so Mightier has has a very profound impact on that. So if you want more information, including how to get a free 30-day trial, visit theautismdad.com forward slash mightier. That's theautismdad.com forward slash mightier. Uh, And we're back. And this week, um, I'm speaking with Dr. Ryan Marino, uh, who is gracious enough to come on the show and and help um, uh, disseminate some facts in regards to vaccines, because there's a lot of misinformation going on out there. And it's especially in the autism community. So um, thank you, Ryan, for, for coming on the show. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Could you just start out a little bit by talking about your background? Um, so I am an emergency physician and a medical toxicologist. So that just means I work in the emergency room, um, but I also have uh, subspecialty training in medical toxicology, which is kind of just the uh, study, treatment, and management of poison patients, um, toxicity, uh, things like drug toxicity, uh, heavy metal exposure, that kind of stuff. Okay. So, so I guess we'll just kind of jump right in because I have a, a list of questions, some that I gathered from uh, uh, from listeners and readers and stuff online. Uh, but basically, we'll start out pretty simple. Like, what do vaccines do, and how, like, how are they supposed to work? So, vaccines basically just present your body with kind of an easier version of either a, a disease molecule um, or, or something that can kind of stimulate your immune system so that it can fight off a disease with, without having to be actually exposed or get sick from that disease. So for things like measles, where we know there can be a high rate of complications, um, it's much better to have kind of this test run um, and develop this immunity without actually getting measles. Um, than it is to go through the disease itself. So like if they're getting the, like the MMR, say, for example, can they actually get measles from the measles vaccine? So uh, for all intents and purposes, vaccines cannot give you uh, any infections. Most most vaccines today are do not use live um, viruses. So you, you cannot catch like the influenza from the flu shot. Um, and that is a, a misconception. And there are some cases where we use um, some live viruses, but these are really rare. Um, that's more of an old fashioned thing. Uh, and in those cases, it's usually like a, a much weaker, weaker example of something um, than, than the disease we're trying to prevent. Okay. Uh, and so like one of the things that I hear f- from vaccine, um, I guess, opponents would would be that you know like if if when my child gets uh the mmr vaccine or his booster then he is shedding um measles virus and can infect everybody around him i i hear that a lot and and so what you're saying is that's just not true so for certain vaccines i mean there there is a phenomenon of of shedding and i'm not an immunologist or a virologist so i don't want to get too into the weeds here um, Mm -hmm. beyond my scope but for all intents and purposes for like a a killed pathogen um, that's not going to be a real issue okay and i think one of the big reasons people think um, that you can get sick from vaccines like i think with the flu shot especially this is a really popular misconception is just that people get flu shots during like cold and flu season um and so the the chances that going into a doctor's office or a hospital 
we're just getting a flu shot in kind of the fall and winter, the chances that you might get a cold within the next week or so uh, are, are pretty high. Okay. So again, that's just a, a misconception. Uh, before mm-hmm. before we started uh, recording today, we, we touched briefly on vaccine injury because that, that seems to be one of the biggest misconceptions that are that are going on around there and and while vaccine injury is real uh it is incredibly rare could could you just kind of give us a little bit of background on on what's going on there and and just kind of give us some of the facts so vaccines have side effects there are definitely some really common side effects i mean people can get a local reaction you can get kind of fever kind of feel sick that's just your immune system is doing what it's supposed to do when you get a vaccine the more serious reactions are incredibly rare um, and they're on the order of kind of one in a million. Um, and so not to say that they don't happen because I mean, millions of people are receiving vaccines. Um, it's just that they are so incredibly rare that that level of safety margin, uh, one in a million risk of having something happen um, is kind of something that you don't see with anything at all. I mean, just everyday life, uh, getting up and walking outside, you have probably a higher risk of having having things injure you than you would from a vaccine. Okay. So how, how do you feel about um, people wanting to spread vaccines out? Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, wanting to do them over a, a longer period of time as opposed to two or three at a time. Is there a, a benefit or a drawback? So I think the drawback is that the vaccine schedule for children is designed to try to cover them and protect them. Um, and it is designed with safe, safety in mind. So with with anything, I mean, in general, but also in medicine, there there's risks and benefits. And weighing the risk versus benefit here, um, a lot of thought, a lot of research has gone into that schedule. Um, and so there, people do want to space them out to kind of reduce having three vaccines in a day, um, but the risk is greater that uh, some sort of infection um, or other more serious complication could happen in waiting to do so. And so that that's why the schedule is the way it is. Um, and they have put a lot of a lot of work into the planning and safety of that. Um, well, I guess then the other sort of million dollar question that kind of floats around uh, do vaccines cause autism? No. That's really easy. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, it's sad that this is still something people people believe and it's that it's still out there. It's There was one bad study by Andrew Wakefield. Everyone's heard of him. I mean, he's still a very prominent figure, unfortunately, even though he went to jail and lost his medical license. Um, but he falsified his research. Uh, and he continues to make a profit off of selling this notion to people. Um, but this question has been asked repeatedly over the years since then. Um, large scale studies have demonstrated, in fact, the opposite, that vaccines have no effect on autism um, and just just have a protective effect on children. All right. Um, OK, herd immunity. So the idea of vaccines is is to get as many people vaccinated as possible so that you can eliminate the the pathogen from infecting and then being able to be spread. So, so what exactly is herd immunity? Why is it effective? So herd immunity is kind of just like good teamwork for everybody. Um, it it's a different percentage for different pathogens. And again, I don't don't want to get too too far out of my own uh, area of expertise. But for measles, which has a very high uh, transmissibility um, and uh, spreads very easily. The herd immunity require, requirement is 95% vaccination. Uh, for most other things, it's a little lower. Um, so say if 95% of the general public has been vaccinated, the chances that someone can get measles and spread it is just so low because there is enough immunity. Um, we know that vaccines are not going to prevent every case of measles um, or flu or whatever. Um, but, but I mean, something is still always better than nothing. Um, and so just having this kind of community barrier is good. And there are people out there who can't get vaccines, people who are immunocompromised, people who have cancer on chemotherapy, have no immune system left. Um, and so, so doing, doing our part 
as a society to kind of protect the more vulnerable people is very important. I mean, young, young infants can't get all of their vaccines right away and they don't have fully developed immune systems as well. Um, but then also, I mean, just preventing kind of mass outbreaks. If you think back to like the, the flu pandemic of 1918, it started in, I mean, very close quarters, things spread from, from person to person. And if, if we have enough people vaccinated, then eventually, e even if people are catching, catching diseases, it'll stop somewhere. Um, and we reduce kind of the risk of global pandemics like that. All right. Uh, I, uh, one of the questions that I pulled, uh, from somebody online was, um, they want to know why they should have their child immunized if all the other kids at school are already immunized. But I guess that sort of goes back to the herd immunity. Yeah. And I mean, so there's a few reasons to do so. First of all, herd immunity, again, is not 100%. If everyone else is vaccinated, um, they can still catch catch uh, an infection. Um, but more importantly, I mean, that child who is not vaccinated is at a much higher risk. Uh, just because everyone else has been vaccinated doesn't mean that the virus or whatever has been totally eradicated. And we saw, um, I mean, again, I hate to keep using measles as an example, but it, because it's so so prominently in the news right now, the uh, United States was declared to be measles free, I think back in 2000 or about then. Um, and most recently within the past year or two, we've been having massive outbreaks um, and we can see that we are not measles free anymore. Um, so, so that's why every, everyone being vaccinated, I mean, is not just good for herd immunity. That is a, a very noble goal, but uh, even on a, a more selfish note, maybe um, just being vaccinated is good for your child. It's good for you um, because you don't want to deal with these things either. My, um, my oldest uh, has CVID, so he needs um, uh, IVIG infusions twice a week. And it's always really frustrating for me when, when people, they, they don't, um, they don't recognize that not only are getting the vaccines for themselves, but they're also protecting the people like my son who, who can't protect themselves and, uh, in, in the very old and the very young, uh, and people with cancer doing chemo and stuff like that, like you had mentioned, um, uh, earlier. So it's, it really is important. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I guess we already answered this question. This was, why should my child get a painful shot if vaccines aren't 100% effective? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, the pain of an immunization, I'm not here to say that there, it's not painful. I mean, I, I was a child myself one day or, or once upon a time. I mean, I didn't like going to the doctor back then, but, uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to get immunizations. I've had to get a bunch this year because of some traveling I did. Um, and I had kind of the, the fevers, the muscle aches, um, but it, it's much better than getting these infections. And in a lot of cases, I mean, some vaccines can prevent cancer. I mean, they can prevent some, some pretty horrific things. So a, a quick little injection is really a, a trade-off that I'm willing to accept and I'm, I'm willing to have my, my patients to willing to offer my patients. I mean. Okay. You, and, and when you talked about the vaccines preventing cancer, I'm assuming you're referring to the HPV vaccine. Yeah. So, uh, the there's, I mean, vaccines against hepatitis virus, um, and against human papilloma virus. And those both can prevent forms of cancer. Um, and, I think in countries like Australia, I want to say, um, they've been tracking since the HPV vaccine was released. Um, and I mean, cervical cancer is the big one that we're talking about. This affects a lot of women. I mean, it can affect even young women and it's a pretty devastating disease, but this also prevents, I mean, like penile cancer in men, um, rectal cancers, throat cancers, um, human papillomavirus is not just some sort of sexually transmitted disease. Uh, it's pretty ubiquitous in society. Most everyone has been exposed to at least one, one or more strains um, by the time they reach adulthood. Uh, and so if we can eliminate these kind of horrific cancers, um, things that people need kind of devastating surgeries for, uh, or much worse treatments down the line, there's definitely a, a significant benefit. Yeah, because there's a lot of a, a lot of the controversy right now seems to surround um, the HPV vaccine. I, I see a lot of things on Facebook and um, just online in general, people just telling people not to do it, that it's unsafe. But that's 
misinformation. Yes. And um, so I, this is kind of a, a little sidebar here, but I was actually in the safety trial for human papillomavirus vaccine for uh, men. And so I got the original series before it was FDA approved um, and I had no adverse events. Um, it, it was approved. It, it is safe. Okay. Now, let me, let me ask you this. When, when it comes to um, people being injured or hurt or have really negative reactions towards the vaccines, is it, is it true that a lot of times that is caused by like genetic mutations or, or uh, susceptibilities in that individual person that is just triggered by something in the vaccine? It's not really the vaccine itself. So yes and no, um, for all intents and purposes for, I mean, the general public, the answer is no, there are very rare genetic mutations that can cause issues for people. Um, however, this isn't, this is another thing that's kind of spiraled out, uh, into, into the public, um, and has taken on a life of its own. So people can get like home, home genetic testing kits and things, um, and looking at certain mutations and these are not, they're not necessarily a concern. Um, if someone does have a concern, I mean, this is something to talk to your doctor about. They're pretty easy to test for. Um, and usually this is something that can be, be predicted pretty well. Um, it's not something that you should spend money on getting a, a private test um, or be, be doing through a private company. Um, just ask your doctor if you have a concern. But I would say for most people, and that's like 99.999% of people, um, there's nothing to worry about in terms of genetics and vaccines. One of the things that um, we've had to deal with in, in my house is we, we have, I have three special needs kids. Um, my youngest has a fever disorder. Uh, PFAPA is the acronym for it. And I don't remember what it stands for, but it's just an idiopathic fever that he gets in these cycles and he breaks out in mouth sores and stuff like that. Um, we, and, and we had our, our kids, their pediatricians are at Akron Children's Hospital, which is a very reputable, uh, facility. Um, they opted to, his, his pediatrician opted to hold off on the MMR when he was younger because he was always running fevers for no reason. And there was no way to know they were afraid of complicating, um, an already medically complicated situation that we didn't know enough about. Uh, and, and once we were able to sort of figure out what was going on and, and be able to better identify the symptoms that he was dealing with every day, um, you know, they were comfortable at that point giving him his MMR. And so it wasn't like we avoided it. It was, I mean, there are medical situations where, where vaccines are contraindicated, but it's not like a religious belief or a paranoid, um, fear. It's there's sound medical reasons for that. Right. Yeah. And I think that case, especially, I mean, it highlights that something very real was going on. Your, your son was having all these fevers and was, was being worked up medically for them. Mm -hmm. And you, you were instructed to kind of hold off on the vaccine. I think the issue is people get this notion that this is something that will just happen after the vaccine. And so if, if nothing bad is going on before the vaccine, there's no contraindication to give it, then there's probably no reason to be concerned. Um, and if you have questions, I mean, asking a doctor is always good, but the, the real situations to worry about are when someone has a condition that usually is known beforehand. Um, these are things that, that can be predicted. Okay. And, and you made a good point. Like, People need to, and I just wanted to, to touch on that and expand on it a minute. People need to talk to their doctors, not um, listen to uh, Facebook posts or or celebrities saying one thing or another. The decision to vaccinate your kids should be between you and your child's doctor. Uh, the medical professionals who who have, uh, you know, they're they're not. There's a thing. There, there's a misconception too. I think where where people feel like doctors are making a killing on vaccines. When in reality, I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's the opposite. I don't think they make much at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I cannot say enough positive things about pediatricians. They are one of the lowest paid specialties in medicine. Um, I, I mean, they're, they're going through all of the same stuff, and it's because they really want to take care of children. They do not make money off of vaccinations. I mean, in a lot of cases they are kind of get, getting underpaid for the services they're providing at these vaccination visits. Um, and they are extremely knowledgeable about vaccines. But there's another misconception that 
they haven't read the inserts, they've never been taught. Um, I mean, that's kind of one of their big bread and butter things is the immunization schedule. Um, and so to, to think of pediatricians as some sort of like profiteering um, or malicious group is just kind of one of the biggest fallacies I think of all. Um, so I would recommend everyone talk to their pediatrician. Uh, they're wonderful people. They'll be more than happy to talk about vaccines um, and answer questions. And if they don't know the answer to a question, they, they know how to look it up. Um, and they'll definitely do so. I, I miss the time where we where we trusted science and medicine. It's it's like we live in a time now where conspiracy theory and misinformation and whatever is said in a Facebook group or something uh, outweighs what your doctor tells you. And that that's that's scary, really, because that that helps a lot of the misinformation to um, uh, disseminate. Uh, yeah, and I think ph pharmaceutical companies their companies. So I'm not here to say that the pharmaceutical industry is all good, but, but certainly they're not all bad. So I understand why people have distrust for, I mean, pharmaceutical products um, and for things being pushed. But I think most people in the medical community, most doctors, most nurses um, want what's best for their patients and do not have conflict of interest with pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so you usually are also the people kind of on the front line. If there is a concern about some sort of pharmaceutical product, They'll be the ones who kind of bring, bring it to attention um, or are trying to make things safer, make things better. And I mean, we do have a lot of a lot of institutions, and regulations in place to keep things safe. But again, vaccines, I mean, among pharmaceutical products are probably the, the safest thing we have that I, I can think of. My uh, my oldest is on clozapine. He has he's been on clozapine for years for uh, schizophrenia and that is a very, very highly controlled medication that we have to go through mm -hmm. tons of red tape and regular blood work, even years and years into this. And, and that was a risk to put him on, but there was literally no other option. He had gone through everything else. And so, uh, you know, there are, there are risks in any type of medication that you take, but, but I mean, vaccines, uh, it just, it blows my mind that we're still having this conversation and we're going into 2020. Uh, but, uh, I do have a couple more questions that were, that were submitted. Uh, one, why, Oh, why do healthy kids need to be vaccinated? So like if your kid's already healthy, why should we vaccinate them? And then I guess in their mind, expose them to something else. Yeah. So that's a good question. And I think another, another big thing that this kind of touches on is the idea of like natural immunity or the body's own immune system. Why do we not just want to rely on that? So we don't want, want to take the chance of a kid getting sick. If it's something like whooping cough, where I mean, not to say that whooping cough isn't serious, but it's, it's probably not going to kill someone. It's just a nuisance. Uh, I would still rather get a, a vaccine because I know that there's very, very, very low risk, almost no risk than risking kind of coughing for six weeks, um, even if it's not going to kill me. But for things like measles, um, I mean, sure, people used to get measles all the time. Um, and the death rate from measles is maybe not astronomical. Um, I, I would say that no deaths would be acceptable. Um, but a thing like measles can actually decimate the immune system. So taking risks with these infections puts a, a burden and a stress and risks the immune system um, for for something like measles, you end up with decreased immunity for the next three years. I mean, a common cold, but then then kill kill a child. So that's why a healthy child should be vaccinated because you don't want to gamble with a child's health. Um, if they're healthy, then they'll have a, a good chance to mount a good immune response from the vaccine. And, and we keep bringing up whooping cough, but I, I was a paramedic for a lot of t a lot of years, and um, I've taken a patient in a child in with whooping cough. And like, it's not going to, most likely not going to kill them. But as a parent, I can't imagine my kid going through that. It's awful. The sound of a child with whooping cough, it's, mm -hmm. it's absolutely awful. And if you can give them a vaccine that will prevent them from having to go through that, even if it's not going to kill them, is it just, it seems like the most responsible thing that you can do as a parent. And, and, uh, I, I have, I just, it's really frustrating when, when people feel like, well, the vaccine, you know, the measles isn't going to kill them or whatever, whatever, but you're letting your child suffer and there is risk, you know? Um, 
Yeah, and what risk of death is acceptable? I mean, if there's essentially as close to zero as possible risk of death from a vaccine, but there's one in a thousand risk of death from measles, I mean, just because that's 0.1%, um, is that acceptable? Uh, I would argue no, uh, but I guess some people seem to think that that's an argument and then ignore that there are a lot of other outcomes besides death that are also a problem. All right. Um, oh, this is another good one. Uh, why do kids need vaccines for a disease that has been eliminated? So, I mean, I think in most cases, these diseases have not totally been eliminated. Um, I'm trying to think of what vaccines we would give for a disease that's been eliminated. Um, like polio, maybe? We don't really do that anymore, right? Yeah, I don't think they give the polio vaccine anymore. Um, so, like, I guess measles was declared eliminated, but yeah. it's it's definitely not eliminated. I think in 2019, 20, going into 2020, we have a, a global global society. People are traveling. Um, I mean, you never know who is walking down the street next to you. They could have been in another continent earlier this morning. Um, and we know that infections are, are prevalent in other parts of the world that aren't prevalent here. Uh, all it takes is, I mean, one person getting off a plane uh, to, to risk everyone. So I think that's probably the safest thing um, is, is why take a risk at all. Yeah. And then if you, if we stopped immunizing for, um, for, for diseases that, uh, like, like measles, if we were, if we had stopped immunizing for measles, I mean, it, the chances of it coming back, especially if it's not completely eliminated would be much higher, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it goes back to herd immunity. I mean, we're maintaining herd immunity, even if a disease is not prevalent, will prevent if, if say someone comes from another place where it is, uh, and brings that in, I mean, it'll kind of stop it in its tracks rather than create a pandemic uh, where nobody has immunity to this disease that they haven't seen in a while. All right. Uh, how long does immunity last after getting a vaccine? So that's a good question. Uh, that depends on both the vaccine and the person. Um, for a lot of vaccines, I mean, immunity can last years and years. I mean, in some cases, it can be considered to be essentially lifelong. Um, but it does, it does depend. So, I mean, I think if anyone has any concerns, the immunity is something that we can test for in most cases. Um, and so, I mean, I, for my job have had to get like levels checked to see if I'm still immune. Um, and even though I had chickenpox as a child, I no longer had immunity to chickenpox. Uh, so I had to get a chickenpox vaccine. Um, and I think, I mean, it was a very easy, just had a, a quick test and then got updated. And now I know that I am immune. Well, especially when you're, when you're in an ER, you're exposed to about everything you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. And chickenpox is a great example. I mean, people it, like for me, it was a pretty benign childhood illness, but I'm, I've seen people who have horrible outcomes from the chickenpox virus. Um, and it is also the thing that causes shingles, mm -hmm. which is a problem that mostly affects older adults, but is a very painful condition. Uh, and if, if you can prevent having any of these issues, even having a few days of like itchy spots uh, at the most benign end here, I, I don't see why people wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. My, I think both my parents had shingles and it was awful. I mean, it was very, very painful uh, for them. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, uh, I guess we already touched on this, but why should everyone get a flu shot each year? So that is because flu strains uh, that are kind of having these like global outbreaks will change every year. There's a lot of different types of influenza and it's a fastly or quickly, I guess, mutating uh, virus. Um, and so these different strains are kind of making their way around different parts of the world every year. And so each year, uh, a, a lot, a lot of scientists spend a lot of time working on predicting which strains will be the most common. And they usually do a, a very good job because this is all completely just prediction. Um, and so they put multiple strains into the flu shot every year. And even on the years where it's reported to be like very ineffective vaccine. I mean, I think a few years ago it was 28% match to the strains. Um, I mean, 28% is still a lot better coverage than 0%. So if that's the worst we're going to get, um, I mean, I think it's still worth getting a flu shot. Uh, and most of the time it's, it's usually very closely matched 
Um, but that's why it changes every year. And, and I think people misunderstand what the flu is. They think uh, when they have like a stomach bug and they're vomiting, that that's the flu. Because I, when I was a kid, that's what we always called the flu. But the flu in reality is an upper respiratory uh, condition that can be very, very dangerous, right? Yeah. So the flu is, uh, as an emergency physician, one of the things that scares me the most because it can really seriously affect young and healthy people. Um, in addition to, I mean, affecting kind of like infants and the elderly. Um, but I mean, I've seen young, healthy 20, 30 year olds get, I mean, bad influenza and pneumonia and people end up dying every year. Uh, there have already been a significant number of influenza deaths in the United States this year. Um, this is predicted to be a, a bad flu season. Last flu season was pretty bad. Um, they, they all kind of seem to be bad, but, um, in, in regards from one year to the next, this year and last year are supposed to be kind of bad, bad flu seasons. So all the more reason to kind of protect yourself. Um, yeah, my kids are, uh, they have their flu shot appointment tomorrow morning. W what is, and because they'll probably listen to this at some point and they get upset with me when I have them, I make them do the injections rather than the nasal mist, which I don't even think they're doing right now. Uh, what is the difference between the flu shot and the nasal mist? So... Um, the nasal mist was not available for several years. I know it's, it's back now and I don't want to give any bad information, but I think the nasal mist is a, uh, is not a killed virus. Um, but I, I might be incorrect on that. It's just, I think the, uh, route of administration is the main difference. Um, there's, there's no significant like risk with, with either one versus the is other. Is one less effective than the other? Uh, there should not be any significant difference in okay. efficacy. Okay. Uh, and then the last question that uh, I got this morning was, what are your thoughts on vaccine stacking? I'm not sure what that What does that mean? I, I don't know. I'm guessing uh, multiple vaccines at the same time. Oh, okay. So I think, yeah, if, if vaccine stacking means getting multiple vaccines in, at one time, the goal there is to try to kind of reduce um, the period of not being immunized. And so I know people have a concern about maybe giving too many things at once. Uh, but we have over the past several decades, even though it seems like children are getting more vaccines, uh, we have found ways to make vaccines more effective and safer. And so there's less antigens, the components in there that are triggering an immune response. The component of that is much smaller. Um, so children are getting smaller amounts of these things to their body and still getting the same efficacy. Um, and so vaccine stacking is just to kind of reduce, reduce that their uh, period of not having immunity um, and kind of give them, give them more immunity all, all at once, all up front. All right. Uh, you had mentioned in the beginning, you know, you deal with a lot of like heavy metal toxicity and stuff like that. One of the, and I guess I should have asked this at the beginning, but um, when people feel or are, are afraid of mercury still being in vaccines or thermosil, uh, what is what is going on with that? I mean, that's that's not accurate information anymore, correct? Yeah. So mercury was taken out of vaccines, um, I believe, in either the late '90s or early 2000s, and this was voluntary um, because of people's concerns, rather than any evidence to suggest that the mercury was causing any problems. So the mercury component. The Marisol um, is, is still used medically in other things. It's just a preservative. Um, it, it prevents kind of other pathogens from growing in the product. Um, so it's not in single-dose vaccinations in the United States. It is in multi-dose vaccinations, which can be used abroad. Um, but that, that product was taken out. It's not been in there for at least about 20 years now. Um, and the form of mercury in thimerosal is actually not significantly toxic to the human body is very quickly cleared. Um, and so, I mean, as, as a toxicologist, I, I have no concerns about thimerosal um, being in vaccines, but again, it's not even there. So the concern should be a, a moot point anyway. Because isn't there, eth is it ethyl mercury and methyl mercury? And methyl mercury, yeah. yeah. So thimerosal uh, is a, a form that's converted into ethyl mercury. Um, and so it's easily cleared from the body. Whereas, I mean, we worry more about methyl mercury exposure being, being pretty toxic, but at these super, super low and minuscule amounts of mercury anyway, um, I mean, it, it's not something to be concerned, but again, it, it 
doesn't even exist anymore. Okay. Um, well, I really appreciate your time. And do you have, if, if you could just kind of reach out to parents and, and just tell them, like, what would you tell them about getting their kids vaccinated? Like, um, what would you recommend? So I would recommend they talk to their pediatricians. I think having having questions is something that every every doctor, nurse, other healthcare provider wants their patients to have. Um, I mean, there is a lot of really bad information about vaccines out there. And so, I mean, I think doctors, nurses, and everyone are trying to do their part to help people understand what's true and what's not. Um, so don't rely on kind of like blogs or uh, celebrities um, or documentaries uh, to, to get information about vaccines. Um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. And I think pediatricians are going to be the most knowledgeable ones about the childhood vaccination schedule. I mean, it, lo it looks like they do actually still give the polio vaccine. So I was wrong about that, which shows I'm not a pediatrician. Um, so, so ask your pediatrician. That's the best advice I have. But I think um, my one takeaway is that if I had to name a single thing that was the most important uh, medical contribution to humanity of the last thousand years, um, or even all time, I would say that that's vaccines. Uh, they've done more for everyone's health, for everyone's life. Um, I mean, for the economy, for society, for everything, um, than kind of any, any other single thing. So vaccines work and they save lives. And you know, the, the other thing too, just to, just to add on to that is, is pediatricians vaccinate their own kids. So, mm -hmm. so if they were, if they were as dangerous as what some people feel they are, doctors vaccinate their own kids. Why would they put their own kids at risk if, if, if they felt vaccines were dangerous or it was some, uh, what do you, you hear, um, con you know, conspiracy with big farm trying to whatever they vaccinate their own kids. And I would never do anything to my kids that I know would endanger them in any way, shape or form. So, so just, you know, keep that in mind. Um, Ryan, I really, really appreciate you, uh, taking the time to come on. Um, I know you're really yeah, busy for me. and, and you brought a lot of insight and I, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I hope that, uh, this helps people to feel more comfortable, uh, or at least spark the conversation with their pediatrician, you know, and, uh, have a great holiday. Merry Christmas. And, you uh, too. I will talk to you later. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, to take a quick second and thank Dr. Marino for coming on the show today and uh, talking to us about vaccines. Um, I know it's a touchy subject. I know people are either going to love it or leave it, and that's fine. They're either going to uh, to follow or they're going to unfollow, and and that's okay. Uh, I just want to use my platform for something positive, and and I feel like getting out the facts to you guys is a responsible thing to do. We, we live in a time where where facts don't seem to matter anymore. And, and that is a tragedy. It truly is. And, uh, if, if in some small part I can help to counter that, then, then it's worth it. Um, so again, uh, Dr. Marino, I thank you for coming on the show. I'll leave his uh, Twitter information in the, uh, description below. Uh, you guys can find me at the autism dad.com. Uh, my social links are at the top. You can hit me up on Twitter. I try to get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, you can uh, help support this podcast. There'll be a link in the description below. Um, that goes to help, you know, with everything. So I do appreciate that. Uh, you can subscribe via any one of your favorite podcasting apps. Just look up The Autism Dad and hit subscribe. I do appreciate that as well. Uh, I look forward to bringing you guys more information in 2020 as season three uh, progresses. Um, if, if anybody's interested in being a guest on uh, this podcast, uh, maybe you're a parent or uh, you, you're an expert on a topic that has something to do with parenting or autism or special needs or, or something along those lines, uh, feel free to send me an email at podcast at the autism dad uh, I'll have that link in the description as well. Uh, we can have a conversation, see if it's a good fit and uh, go from there. So again, I really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. I hope you have a safe and happy new year and I look forward to um, talking to you again. So until next week, I'll catch you later. See you. Bye.
Autistic kids can sometimes struggle to learn new skills such as riding a bike, reading, or simply having a conversation to a high level of proficiency and automaticity. Brainiac is a brain enhancement program that gets to the root of the problem. It builds stronger brain and body connections that elevate learning capacity within four to six months. Brainiac cross-trains motor movement, visual, auditory, and cognitive thinking connections using fun, interactive video games. Strength and connections allow kids to learn new skills and perform them automatically with more confidence and greater independence. Brainiac is for homes and schools. Visit canoe.com. That's K I N U U dot com. And be sure to use the code The Autism Data at checkout to save $500. It's a limited time offer and it will expire on May 31st.